and are going to be part of a conversation. I've sent them a series of questions for them to look over before this evening. And so we'll kind of start off by going over those and letting them answer from their perspective. And then we'll have an open Q&A. So I would like to welcome Franny from uh, UAC Green Guides. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having um, me. Thank you. I'd also like to welcome Sharmila from the Youth Justice Collective. Hi, thanks for having us. me. Yes. And then I'd like to um, welcome Allegria from Sunrise, Sunrise Tucson. Hi, thank you for having me. And then, of course, Chelsea from Students for Sustainability. Thank you. And then we have Ursula and Ruby who've joined us from High Schoolers for Climate Justice. Thank you so much for being here. Hi, Thanks thank for you. Us. Yes. All right. So we're going to go ahead and start in with the first question. And some people have already kind of been picking away at this, wondering what your organizations do. But the first question is, in what way does your particular organization support sustainability? And what I'm going to do is I'll just go across my Screen, and the first person who comes up and then I'll go through my names here make sure everybody gets the answer but we'll start with Chelsea if you don't mind yeah sure so as mentioned I am representing students for sustainability we are a student-led student government program here at the University of Arizona and our purpose is to help students pursue their own projects on campus so if there's something that they would like to see happen we help facilitate that change um, a few examples of the projects that we've already done is um, Market on the Move, which brings affordable fresh produce to students during the farmer's markets that usually occur pre-COVID. Another one is working with the Office of Sustainability to install agrivoltaics on top of the ENR2 building. And that's just a combination of combining solar panels and plants in order to facilitate um, high efficiency use of those solar panels and generate energy for the university. And then last one, um, that's a pretty big one, is the community garden. Our garden committee manages that for everyone in the community to enjoy growing their own fresh produce. Wonderful, thank you. So the next person across my screen is Sharmila. Hi, um, so I'm representing the Youth Justice Collective and we are a group of um, students in, Ar in Arizona and Tucson specifically who are trying to educate and engage our community in civic engagement and activism. Um, so this past year, our, the way that we were working in sustainability and climate justice um, was that we did a lot of election work trying to elect um, leaders in Arizona who um, care about the environment and who had um, policies that would try and um, promote climate justice in Arizona. We also um, host a lot of webinars, which are more educational, where we bring in um, political leaders, students from the community, um, other community leaders, and um, just students in general to come and discuss really important issues. Um, and we've had an environmental justice webinar um, where we invited um, the mayor who came to speak and people got to ask her questions about her climate plan um, and were able to give her feedback. Um, so yeah, a lot of our work centers around um, education and engagement with between students and political figures in our community. Great, thank you. Next I have Ursula and Ruby. So um, yeah, we're here from uh, High School for Climate Justice and um, I would echo Shamila, uh, we focus a lot on education. Um, because, you know, a big part of the puzzle is that this is going to be an ongoing battle and we have to sustain that battle into the future. So we want to help do that. And then um, with more traditional sustainability work, we definitely um, focus more on like the political like activism side, but we support all different types of organizations because we're all working for the same thing. Absolutely. Thank you. Brandy? Hi. Yeah, so I work for the University of Arizona as Green Guides. I would say this is primarily a resource for university students. Our main um, idea is that we're, we're communicating bigger ideas with the students and also communicating opportunities across campus and across the country. So 
we'll be sharing sustainability tips all the time, just little things you can do around your house or um, providing resources for how to pursue a career in sustainability or get internships in sustainability. So we have a monthly newsletter where we're sending out those opportunities called the Green Growth Network. Um, and we also take a lot of time to try and get student features and highlight what different students are doing in the environmental space at U of A. Um, more generally, AIR is an institute that houses a lot of diverse interdisciplinary ideas around sustainability. So combining the departments at the U of A, so we're not just talking with um, the School of Natural Resources, but we're also getting input from the English department and math department and, and different ways that the university can uh, focus on sustainability in all of its different areas. Great, thank you. Allegra. Hi. Um, so um, our organization um, right now is working um, on policies and, and campaigns that will help uh, to foster systems of change to better lead to regenerative development um, for the future. Um, we're doing a lot of outreach and support to uh, through like community organizing, um, meeting with different people um, and speaking about um, what a regenerative community and development looks like. Thank you. So you're all doing so similar in, in the way you're coming about it. It's just who you're actually directly involved with. My next question was, do you feel that ethics is at the heart of sustainability? And how do you feel that that would be the case if so? So Kelsey, if you would answer. Yes, thank you. Um, I would say yes. I think that even when the issue of economics or health is brought to the table and is a logical reason to support sustainable practices, often respect for the planet or even care for future generations or for others is a more impactful way to engage people in a movement. And that's just what I've seen in my personal experience. And I think it usually drives the message home that you're looking out for your loved ones when you're looking out for the planet. I absolutely agree. Sarmila, do you have anything to say on that? Yeah, I would agree with Chelsea. I, I also think that ethics are um, at the heart or at least a really big part of um, environmental justice and getting people involved. I think definitely trying to play at their emotions and um, explaining why it it is like a good thing to do as a good person, I feel like um, makes a big difference. I do think that um, financial incentives tend to be really successful, at least in legislation and what we've seen with um, successful policy across the country. So I don't wanna downplay any of that, but I do think that um, a lot of people, at least who are involved in environmental justice work and um, who are really passionate about it are here for ethical reasons. Thank you. Ursula and Ruby. Um, yeah, so definitely agreeing with what Sharmila and Chelsea have said. Um, it's definitely like at the center, if not like it's the biggest part. I'd say another big part of sustainability is just like general responsibility um, because obviously this isn't like climate change as a whole isn't just one person's issue. It goes back to decades of political inaction and just you know, big corporations not being held accountable. So those companies and corporations and politicians should feel the sense of responsibility um, to push them to become more sustainable. But I think for more like, you know, everyday people, I think ethics is definitely at the heart of it. Thank you. Franny, if you'll join in. Uh, yeah, I definitely can echo a lot of the same sentiment I would say in maybe like a more of a negative way, like we don't have the financial motivations attached to sustainability right now. So ethics has to be at the center of it. Um, and I think with, if we're going to take action at the right time and be proactive about these things, um, we need ethics at the center because the financial motivations might only come when we have 
had too much inaction that it, we need to transfer our energy or things, but um, that does need to happen earlier. So I definitely think right now we're depending on leaders that lead with ethics in mind. And a lot of our jobs here is to try and convince leaders that they should be doing that as well, if they're not right now. Thank you. Allegria? Um, so I have a little bit of a different perspective. Um, I think that um, sustainability um, began with ethics, um, but I think that right now um, it's kind of like at a turning point where we're kind of asked to um, question what it is that we're sustaining. I think that when it began, we had decades still to preserve the earth. And right now, um, our oceans are near extinction. Um, our forests are ruined. Um, not ruined, but they are greatly depleted. And um, our biodiversity is, um, is also greatly um, in danger. Um, and I have, and that's not even to speak about what is happening to um, human populations in other countries um, that are living close to this, uh, this disaster, these disasters. Um, and so I think that when it comes to sustainability, um, the, I think the question is like, what are we sustaining? Um, because like we in this developed country um, continue to like pull resources from those other countries um, and from our ocean. Um, and so sustainability to me is about um, keeping up a system. Um, and I think that we have to reconsider um, it's about keeping up a system for now and in the future. And I think we have to reconsider um, if that is still working. Um, I think it's time to, I think that what Sunrise has been um, talking about, um, and especially Sunrise Tucson, um, is about reevaluating um, what is better for our communities, um, individually especially. Um, because each community is different. And I think that that's a big part of um, the Sunrise Movement is that each individual community um, has different needs. Um, like if you were to go to the LA Hub, a, lot, a large part of their needs uh, and what they are working on is housing, um, housing, um, lowering the housing, uh, crisis um, and giving homes to the houseless. Um, it's definitely something that we should be doing here in Tucson as well. Um, and it's something that is going to be brought up in our listening sessions. Um, but here in Tucson, we have a heat, uh, a heat emergency. Um, we have large wildfires. Um, we have solar energy, but are not really putting our, our our time and our energy um, into funding those things. And we have a monopoly with TEP. So to say that like we want to sustain the systems that are currently in place and, and call ourselves ethically sustainable, um, I don't think that it's, I don't think our sustainability right now is entirely ethical. I think that there are a lot of groups right now that are ethical in their practices, but I don't think that like the systems that are um, in place are sustainable. And so, yeah. Thank you, perfect. This is exactly why we asked for several voices because each of you bring parts of this and bring it to the table for conversation. So I really appreciate the different perspectives the different things that each of you have added in and the fact that truly we have to look at sustainability as a whole. I personally 
have looked at my life for the last 15 or 20 years, so about the time you've been alive, and I look at my life on a daily basis as to, is this sustainable? Whether it's the food that I eat, the house that I live in, the friendships that I have, the relationships that I have, the work that I do, these things I have to address because am I adding to the overall sustainability, not only for myself, but for those around me? So thank you very much for being able to participate in that question and expand it out from other perspectives. I really appreciate that. So our next question is, what is your biggest fear about our current experience and for the future? Because there's a lot of things that I consider to be very scary right now, but I think each of us look at it from our own perspective or what those around us in our community are dealing with or suffering from. So I'm curious to hear from you. We'll start with Chelsea. Yeah, my biggest fear, I think, is the climate disasters. Um, I've seen just how it affects people in so many ways in the planet as well, from exacerbating environmental degradation to health issues especially respiratory ones that we're seeing right now combining with COVID-19 and displacement of people from their homes, more food insecurity. And some examples that are closer to home for me is that I'm from California. We've been seeing uh, more wildfires, droughts, and rising sea levels. Actually, just about 10 minutes from my own home, um, the coast actually vanished an entire parking lot from um, a beach that people used to play basketball at and I went to go play one day and it was gone. It's just very alarming to see that this isn't just something that we're learning about in school. It's actually happening. The sea levels are rising and it's affecting us in our own states, in our own homes, in our own cities. So I think climate disasters, it's what um, is causing most fear for me. Thank you for that. Sharmila? Yeah, I think for me, um, one of my biggest fears is that we it's really hard in our current political system with the way that um, the parties are so polarized right now to set up um, systems that will last for a really long time to make change. Um, and I think like policy, environmental legislation, policies, like we've seen how easy, easily it can be undone and then reinstituted. Um, and that's not sustainable um, for um, how our country needs to move forward when it comes to addressing the climate crisis. So my biggest, and, and I think a huge part of that is that um, it's like returning to communities, seeing what you can do with your community on an individual basis without relying on big political structures that um, really have never worked as they should when it comes to addressing environmental protection. Um, but yeah, so my biggest fear I would say is like with the way that our political system currently is um, just not having sustainable policies or legislation that will last beyond one administration, two administrations. Thank you. Uh, yeah, that's something that we definitely need to address and look at changing. I think that that's become very clear, especially in the last four or five years um, for two people who it wasn't clear at all to before. Ursula and Ruby. I personally don't think you can really pick one greatest fear because also within the issue of climate justice and climate change, you already um, have like one horrifying lens that's purely environmental. And then there's a whole social aspect, which isn't any less scary. In fact, sometimes it's more scary because it's you see it more. Um, and I think that all of that together is what's so scary and definitely what Shamila said about how right now with the current systems in place, like we're not able to make change. It's of my belief that like right now it's impossible and it's not just fixing a system. It's like completely tearing it down and rebuilding and what if there's not enough time? Um, or what if it's not what people want? Like what if there's not enough people that want it? I think that is what is really scary is that people don't want to change um i think mine and maybe this is like a little selfish of me to say but i think one of my biggest fears is that i'm going to be half like i'm going to have to be doing this work for the rest of my life um and like not to say that i don't enjoy it i 
really do enjoy doing this work. I enjoy helping people and I like get a lot out of it too. Um, but like, it's so draining and it's so taxing and it's so depressing. And that's not how I want to live the rest of my life. Like I'm only 16. I have so much ahead of me. Um, and I don't want to be stuck doing this work that like should have been taken care of in the eighties. Um, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I hear you. I am on the verge of turning 50 in the next year or so. And I was born two years after the first Earth Day. So this has kind of been part of my life and my awareness level and my existence and a lot of the work that I've done for the last 30 years in my aspect of doing my jobs in the world. And I don't see it ending anytime soon. So I absolutely hear that statement from you, Ruby. Thank you. Franny, if you'll join in. Yeah, um, I would say my biggest fear is that we're gonna maintain our mindset that profits come over people. I think you see that in every institution in the United States and every company. Um, you know, that's just constantly a message that that's coming through. Um, I also think our young leaders do feel the urgency of climate change. And as you've heard, like we're terrified of it and it's horrible. <laughs> and I just think there's so many leaders that aren't even willing to recognize the problem. You know, um, climate change is going to devastate people of color and it's going to devastate the global south right way before it ever hits a billionaire. So having to like give that urgency to other people is a, is a fear I have and I have no idea you know, how to do that. Um, and I also can definitely echo what Ursula and Ruby said that um, we, I don't know that the systems we have now are going to work. Um, I don't know that capitalism was ever intended to keep the environment um, in a healthy place and it's currently not. And the companies, you know, doing green campaigns and all of these things like their existence is what's causing the problem, not how they make their genes. Um, so, I think there's a lot of problems there that freak me out that uh, the, the answers are, are too big for, for my tiny brain to wrap my head around at this time. Thank you. Yeah, there's a lot of that. There's a lot of uh, aspects of corporation and capitalism that has become so commonplace that I think that it's very difficult for us to be able to even have an a tenth of a degree of knowledge about how much damage is happening and we're still encouraged to continue to create more businesses continue to create more products but creating those that are green or earth friendly is one of the harder things to do in my experience allegri if you'll join in yeah um i definitely agree with like everything that everybody is saying um i think like my biggest fear is that um it'll just be like business as usual um i think that um especially like i think that uh as we have seen like as we know like climate scientists have known about um climate change for decades and we've we already said that um but like it is now like more critical than ever um, that we make change now. And, um, and I think that something that um, really has struck me um, about like this last election even was like the massive turnout of like marginalized people of like um, of, of our minority communities um for people in the democratic uh party um and then um for i think the like for the democratic party then to like turn around and not really like openly say things that are in support of those people um and not fight as hard for them um and, and it seems to me like it, it's just like, um, it, it's only like they're going half of the way instead of like there's like a middle ground that they want to continue to hold 
to fight for um, their base, like a larger base, um, even though the people who like gave them their their political slogans, who gave them like the like their whole like campaign and what they are fighting, what they say that they're fighting for are the people who like are dying in the streets and who are being killed by police officers and who like are having bills written against them. And like, it's, it's just, and like, I think about like, about like murdered indigenous women who just are missing and nobody talks about them. And it's just like, how is that happening? And we are having only like inches we are having inches of progress when the real progress that needs to happen is that the Democratic Party who won needs to say, like, these are the people that we're fighting for. These are the people who, like, need change. And, and it's just, it, it's mind boggling to me. And then, and additionally, <laughs> that's what freaks me out about the democratic party what freaks me out about the republican party is not the people who are in power because they already have shown that they are disgusting and i can't with them but what freaks me out is that um the people who are like our neighbors and who who continue to be manipulated um are like that the people in power continue to manipulate them and like that that cycle continues and it doesn't seem there doesn't seem to be a way to break it that's what freaks me out i so badly wish that there was like a way to break that cycle because they are like they're regular like they're people and i know that they have that they are white supremacists and they are bad and like all of those things but i cannot like i am buddhist and i also have a lot of compassion in my heart for people who are like also living in poverty who like are just getting manipulated by a wealthy like news channel and who are being manipulated by people in power and it just it, it that freaks me out a lot it a lot and I can't help but think that like the the manipulation that is happening and the lack of care for their lives during a pandemic when they would do literally fuck sorry excuse me I'm cursing but they would do anything uh for their for that it's just like it doesn't make sense to me logically um so it that scares me and i think that partisan policy politics is something that like uh i think i think it was franny said it we need it like or or ursula maybe we need to just like tear it down it just doesn't make any sense and it seems really dangerous to people who um deserve uh opportunities to like actually thrive in life. Yeah, so I'm done. Thank you. I think the fear is very real. And I think honestly, we should all be very afraid. Um, and maybe out of that, be able to come up with solutions and ways to work together. Um, the partisan line is a very difficult line to walk. And it means that we don't get very far. And I agree with that because we're constantly trying to accommodate and to make somebody else happy and keep them on board with us. So we will have to see what happens. I am really personally hoping that over the next 10 years, as you are getting further out in the world and hopefully not having to fight so hard for all of this, that because so many of the politicians that we currently have in these high positions have been in there for so long that they will be aging out or sadly and happily dying off 
and that we will be able to make some positive change. But I appreciate the aspect of looking at, at politics as a main concern and that there are so many different factors that feed into that fear. So the next question is, what about anger? Is there anything involved in sustainability that actually makes you angry? Because that's a totally different vibe. Chelsea? Yes, this is actually what brought me into sustainability, this topic of environmental racism. And that's just um, explaining the fact that your race is the biggest indicator of your environmental exposure over every other factor. And along with that, your zip code has more of an effect on your health than your genetic code. It really doesn't matter um, like what your genes are made of and your genetics, like your health, if you inherit any kind of predispositions, where you live really indicates how much pollution you are exposed to. And I think that is just disastrous. And especially the part about race that I mentioned. If you're even like sharing the same space with a neighbor, the fact that your race has a bigger indicator of your environmental exposures than just your location, I think that's a big indication of a problem here. And this goes hand in hand with laws and policies that we've been talking about, how they've taken advantage of marginalized communities, allowing for corporations and landfills to open in their neighborhoods in order to pollute these areas because they know that they have less political resources to fight against this. And this was, you know, shown in history that when a landfill was even proposed to open in a richer, wider neighborhood, that everyone fought against it. They had the resources, and so it didn't happen. But then what happened right afterwards is that they moved it to the lower income, more marginalized community. And that's just something that angers me and I don't think is right at all. Thank you. Sharmila? Yeah, I actually wanted to go back to what um, uh, Alegria, sorry if I'm pronouncing your name wrong, um, what you were saying about um, the the way that politicians um, on both sides of the political spectrum um, will get into power and then not do anything to help their constituents. Um, a lot of, because I, I, I just feel like a lot of the reason why people are in politics is to get reelected and not to make change, which is why it's really important to elect people who are different breaking that norm and who are different than that but um yeah the saddest thing is just like seeing um like campaign slogans and like people running on platforms that they never implement because it's never uh in their best interest to get reelected once they're there um like i think kirsten cinema is a great example of somebody who i had really high hopes for going into the arizona senate and then has been more conservative than every single other democrat in the senate um and stuff like that is really frustrating especially like what Allegria was saying about people who fought for those uh candidates to be in that position of power and then for them to like not give back to those communities is um really heartbreaking and really angering and makes you want to like not continue doing this work because um there's the question of like what is the point but that's why it's really good to fight for candidates who are not like that <laughs> absolutely Thank you. Ursula and Ruby. I totally agree with what Sharmila said, especially about like Kirsten Cinema. We've put like HS4CJ has put a lot of effort into trying to push cinema certain directions. And it just, we've gotten like no engagement from her or her staffers or her office. Um, but that's not what I want to talk about. Um, one of the things that makes me really angry around sustainability and just around like climate change as a whole is the education around it, especially in the public school system. Um, in November, we did a presentation for the North American Association for Environmental Education. Um, and it was basically all about how like climate education is lacking um, and you know where specifically it's lacking and what teachers um, specifically can do about it. Um, and just looking into some of the like statistics around climate change education. There's like 14 states that don't require um, comprehensive climate change education like anywhere in their standards. Um, there's some that in their standards, it uh, pushes teachers to address climate change as 
kind of like a belief instead of a scientific fact at this point, even though we know that 97% of actively publishing climate scientists agree that or, climate change is man-made. Um, or as a debate topic, which is yeah. like a whole other like thing. Yeah. And then the whole thing with the like carbon footprint test, that's one of the like most used tools in the classroom to teach climate change. And people don't even know the history behind it. Basically, like the uh, BP, British Petroleum, created the carbon footprint test to try to shift the blame away from them and other corporations that were causing massive amounts of pollution um, and onto everyday people so that, you know, people strive to be more sustainable while, poli or while corporations are like let off the hook. Um, and that's just really, really aggravating to me, especially like as a student who's been through the public school system, um, you know, it wasn't until maybe seventh grade that I got like actual climate change education. And even then, like it was maybe a week long unit. So it's just really frustrating and definitely something that needs to be addressed more. Yeah. To piggyback off of what you said about um, the carbon footprint test, um, I also think that that stuff is something that angers me. And we've been focusing on like outward stuff that's against like our movement, which obviously is super, like a super big issue, but there's also a lot that angers me within the movement, um, especially around individual change versus system change. Like obviously individual change is great. If you have the resources and the wants to be more sustainable as a person, like go for it, that does, it does something. And if everyone can get there, then the world will be a better place. But when you have that be a focus, it pushes the solution and the blame on low income individuals, on people of color, on the people who like are fighting for change the most, you know, like indigenous women have been leading environmental, like everything for so, 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 so long, like before we, yeah. Um, but those tests and that kind of thinking pushes all of that on marginalized people. Um, and yeah, that's what's that's what's pushed out there as an introduction to climate work, which is disturbing because then we don't really get anywhere. I'll Thanks. jump in. Um, I would say the thing that makes me, I, I guess it, it comes from a couple of different directions, but like the most upsetting thing that I've experienced is like the idea that we need to centralize sustainability and and reinvent the wheel on how to fix these problems. I don't think that the solution is to have a unit at the university that um, deals with everything under the realm of sustainability. I think it needs to be that every institute within a university or within a community needs to think about sustainability to some capacity. And the idea that the best way to do it is efficiently and in the same way we do all of our capitalist business <laughs> ideas, like like sustainability doesn't work in the same way that the systems we have works. And, it, and it's not going to be solved in an efficient way. Like we can't make our metrics simply carbon neutrality. I think that really makes me so angry because thinking that, you know, net zero carbon is gonna solve all the world's problems. Like, yes, it's helpful and it's so good, but ignoring the communities that were affected before we got there is just like, very upsetting um and then i would also say that like on that topic communities are capable of sharing their problems i think we just need more people communicating what the communities need rather than coming up with these blanket solutions that are going to solve a problem for every community in america we need that community to share their problems with our representatives or share their problems with um university institutions and then work to like create solutions based on an individual basis rather than um like blanket solutions i also like ursula and ruby i think everyone's kind of touched on it uh corporate sustainability and like greenwashing is just super angering too i think putting individuals at fault for the climate crisis and telling us we need to buy from a different place um, rather than informing us of like new practices <laughs> is is not helpful and yeah again like the carbon footprint stuff is is just like 
it's very frustrating to know that that's what all that some people think about when they think of sustainability, when in reality, we could all be working together to change the systems that we work under so that they're community focused, um, rather than trusting these corporations who have failed us to solve the problem. Thank you very much. Yeah, is it me? Um, yeah, um, I largely agree with what um, everybody's been saying. I definitely feel like um, my anger is is def is pointed more towards like is it's mostly I I get angry about a lot of things, but I think that. Um, I think that I'm I'm angry that like it is it's easy to call something sustainable um in capitalism and um like like we were all saying that like for the individual it, it's it then like it makes it easier for like the individual to um feel guilty if it's not um and then it like puts like that onus on them. And I don't know, it, it's like a, it's a really messed up system that capitalism has like created. And I think that I'm probably most angry that the, that there isn't more um, accountability um, by, governments and by like organizations um that are like supposed like that i don't know that like that they aren't i know that like not everybody is an environmentalist and i know that not everybody um But I just, I don't know, I, I guess what makes me angry is that when I see like things, I don't know, has anybody watched Seaspiracy? I literally just watched it and it drives me insane um, to know that like that amount of like, uh, brutality and that we can like pl plumage and like kill that many fish just for capitalism um when i like saw the devastation and i like i keep bringing these images up and i i i just know that like these are products of capitalism and i think that like when i see those things for me it just makes me so more than angry it makes me really hurt <laughs> i i think that more than angry i am i hurt for our planet and i am just like how do we do that how i'm like and i want it makes me want to do something and i think that um when i'm in something that i always say is like i can't if i'm angry then i let it feels like letting people think business organization because then i can't continue to fight um i know anger in some situations uh for some people it's how they fight um it's what helps get them out of bed but for me personally um when i'm angry i'm not a good person to talk to um so i don't fight with um and i my activism is centered around the fact that like I fight for my own life I fight for the life of this little dog I fight for like the lives of like these trees like the planet and like my my family and like you guys and like everybody living here and I just want like that's where my activism comes from is like wanting to make the world better for all of us and whenever I see something like those things like my anger starts and then it na it just navigates back to like 
I have to fight for you guys. And yeah, exactly, Jenna. Um, and so um, I don't know um, Ursula and Ruby, if it's Ruby, is that um, you mentioned that like you find it hard to keep doing this work and I totally understand, um, I hear you. It is really hard to keep doing this fight when you like, it's really depressing to not always have like a clear result all the time or not know when it's gonna end and you have like bad things happen. But I think that at least in my experience, there's community and there are friends and there are people to hold you in the struggle. Um, so I don't know, I just wanna, I think that we have like something to fight for. Um, and I wanna encourage you to keep, keep going. I think that that's what, at least in my mind, that's what regenerative community and regenerative development is about. It's not just like, let's keep doing the same thing over again. Let's like build something new. And yeah, that's, that's where I'm gonna end it. Sorry, I just, I went on too long. <laughs> Can I say something about that community aspect really quick? Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's obviously really hard work, like no matter how much you're involved, like it's incredibly mentally and physically and it's draining, but like the most powerful moments that I've experienced like in my life have been while like organizing. And I don't know, it's, like I was saying earlier, this is going to co totally contradict it, but you know, I'm scared that like people don't want things to change, but in those moments you can see and you can feel that there are groups of people, there is huge groups of people that do want that change and that's really powerful and that like both rekindles and also like helps fan the fire of like fight Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Absolutely. I, I think that um, it is hard work and it takes a toll. And especially having a year like we've had this last year on top of that makes it even harder because there's so much that has gone negative for sustainability and environmentalism in the last year just due to how we've tried to respond um, with masks and gloves and, and just all the extra things and then the takeout foods and all of these things where yes we want to support our little businesses but then there's all of the backlash of that so there's a lot of different things um, that we'll still have to rectify from this last year that adds more weight to it but thank you for speaking about the anger. Thank you for speaking about the fear and thank you for speaking about how the community support helps and encourages you to keep going. So I really appreciate that. So next question is, do you feel that putting your money where it speaks most is helpful, especially on a youthful income? And is it hard to do? I think in part, it is helpful because just a hundred companies are responsible for 71% of global emissions. And we know that these companies will follow money, if anything at all. Um, so if people vote with their wallet for sustainable products, then the market would shift to cater to that. Um, ultimately, though, I would love to highlight that in a way this shifts responsibility to the consumer and to the people and away from the polluters and the companies. So that's why I think policy change would be the biggest helpful way to tackle this issue. And um, with regard to the other parts of the question, I think youthful incomes can benefit from buying more sustainably, but they can also, it could also be less attainable um, because while meat products and dairy products can be more expensive, you know, like the grains and the um, the beans and whatnot, like they could be very easily attainable. Um, it's that also means more cooking and fast food usually doesn't offer as many of those options that, you know, don't offer meat or uh, plant based meals. So as for being a student, you know, time is also another thing that's not 
very attainable. And as myself, I live in a dorm, so I don't quite have as much access to a full kitchen all the time to make myself those meals. Um, so that's why I want to highlight that part. But I also want to be very careful about centering environmental change in the most impactful way to make environmental change around consumerism. Um, because one, we shouldn't be buying more things to generate more waste. Um, but two, it's also not fair to shame people for buying what they are able to afford or what they are able to have. Um, in some cases, such as in my experience, my family receives resources from a local food pantry. So we don't get to choose what we're given and what we consume. We just get what they have and what is left over from these grocery stores that would have otherwise be thrown away. Um, so the last thing I want to do is to shame people for what they are eating or have access to and be exclusive and make sustainability kind of, you know, like this bubble of people that consume certain green things. Yeah, I completely agree with that. Um, just to add on to what Chelsea was saying, I think um, like the whole, and everyone's talked about this, but yeah, sh shifting the blame onto consumers or the responsibility onto consumers to um, live the most like green, sustainable life that they can when um, it's really hard to do that because companies and like the way that we live is like so hard to be sustainable because we're so reliant on big corporations. Um, and I also really appreciate Chelsea's point about like time and especially being a student, like um, having to pay for college and having to pay for living expenses and all these other things, um, like choosing to then pay for like an expensive eating style or something is like not always attainable um, or is only like selectively attainable for um, wealthier individuals. Um, and I think like another thing that I, I've been thinking about a lot is like the um, the push, like community push around like everyone being vegan uh, is really hard to do, especially like thinking about Arizona, thinking about like food deserts, specifically on places like the reservations. Um, it's really, really hard for people to have access to vegetables and fresh things in general. So making it, um, so, so shaming people about what eating choices they're making when they don't really have very many options, I think is really harmful. Um, but on a broader point about money and um, the environment, I think like individual kind of what Ursula was saying earlier about like in what you can do as an individual is always great but in general like we shouldn't be focused that shouldn't be the focus of our environmental justice it should really be tackling these larger corporations since they are the ones at fault for the current um, situation that we're in thank you Ursula and Ruby, do you want to chime in on that one? Yeah. Um, so when I first read this question, I kind of took it more in a um, like direction of like donations and like mutual aid and stuff like that. Um, and like the reality of our world is that money matters. You can't do anything without money. It's like it's impossible. And although it would be great if that could change, that's not happening right now. So like donating to different organizations and to mutual aid funds is crucial. And that is a really important way to like support your beliefs and to support people. Um, that being said, that's also hard to do. Um, you know, as a high school student, you know, I'm 16, I'm just a junior in high school. Like I don't have really access to money. I'm looking for a job right now, but like, before this, I haven't had a job. And so I don't have like money to give, um, even if I want that. And sometimes, you know, I, I want to help more. Um, yeah, it's just, yeah. Yeah, I think um, donations is definitely, I'd say for like low income people and also like students and um, just, those kinds of people that don't have like a super stable or super like high income. I think donations is a much better way to like put your money where your mouth is when it comes to climate justice. Um, like HS4CJ depends entirely on donations. Um, and, you know, we're slowly running out of funds because we don't get a lot of donations. Um, 
And I know that that's the reality for a lot of other local organizations, especially student-led organizations. Um, so yeah, donating um, and setting up mutual aid funds, I'd say is more important than, you know, being vegan and trying to get everything you eat to be locally sourced or um, waste-free. Um, yeah. Um, I'll preface my answer with like, as a collegiate climate activist, I think there's a lot of limitations with like what we can do underneath a system that already perpetrates um, some of the problems within our climate. So this is sort of like from the perspective of what I can do as like a student worker at a college. Um, but luckily with my job, I've been able to like post things about, um, you know, where posting where your money mouth or putting your money where your mouth is and, you know, maybe eating less meat and, and those types of things that you can do as an individual. I know personally, like, um, if you phrase it in the correct way, I, I do think that doing things individually is one of the ways that I feel like more in control with the climate movement. I know that like my personal activism isn't like changing the whole world, but like if it could give me a peace of mind so that I can then go challenge that system later in the day with good food in my stomach, like that does feel good and I I do like appreciate people who are taking time to like think about sustainability every day because even if you know being vegan isn't going to change the entire world like you when you're making your meal are thinking about things that you might not think about otherwise um and thinking about sustainability in your everyday life so I do think the incorporation um is important. I also think it's important to highlight not only things you can do with your wallet, but like things you can do in your community for free that are sustainable. Um, something that I really try to do uh, through like that my Instagram account that I run is just posting like uh, at the U of A campus, you know, where can you get like where, where should you bike? Can you rent bikes from different places so you don't have to drive there? Or, you know, can you get nice produce from an organization on campus? Can you find some of these resources that are hard to find um, in our space? And can we make our community more centered around being sustainable all the time? Um, which I think has been a good way for me to just like take control of the small thing that I touch every day and, and make sure that people at least feel they have a little bit of that control as well. Um, I think outside of being a, a worker and, and working in sustainability, you can do a lot more like sharing of how to dismantle systems and, and talking to representatives and, and those things are so valuable and are going to be the reason that we tackle the climate crisis. Um, but I would say that I do think doing as much as you can on an individual level can just be good for the mind. and. Uh, make you feel all right but I I'm sad that some people frame this in a way that makes it like shaming for not being able to I think we should just have an expectation that everyone does as much as they can and if that's nothing at all that is okay um and if that's you know changing your whole lifestyle and becoming zero waste that's also okay um and I commend you for being able to do that Um, I think what everybody's saying is fantastic. Um, and I, I feel like, uh, I think I might be one of the older people here. I'm, I'm no longer in college. Um, and so I've been kind of in the working world for a while, but I'm, uh, still young. Um, so as far as like how I think that young people, when I heard this question, I actually thought about how um i've been in the working world for a while so i i when i when i make money um and it's held in my banks it that question resonated like how what happens when my bank is holding my money um and i recently was exploring like what my bank does with my money and my bank is wells fargo and I just found out that Wells Fargo is one of the largest banks that contributes to the fossil fuel industry. And so I'm changing banks. Um, but that was something that um, 
I thought that like as like young people um it's important to be like knowledgeable about like what where our, where we hold our money even um when we do uh Chase is bad too um where we hold our money um when we do spend it um and in the conversation about um like sustainable living um I I think that like when I feel like it's it's something that like as you try and like find like a, a balance for yourself I try to eat as little meat as possible um I'm living with my family and I have had multiple conversations with them we've watched multiple documentaries about um the meat and fish industry um but uh it's something that like i think that when you live and work with other people um like franny was saying you can only be responsible for yourself and so i myself do not eat uh but it's you you can't like shame anybody else and so my conversation was with my family to like try and see if we could all come to an agreement about it and see if that could make our all, everything pathetic. But um, when I realized that that was not happening, I was agree. I think something happened to your microphone. Did you knock it or something? No. Can you hear me? It's better now. Thanks. Okay. Um, sorry. There's uh, my neighbor is outside with their with their child. Um what um but i just wanted to say that like when i think when you as we like i think it's just about finding um a balance and so i i as i i eat as little meat as possible and i think that like um i think that what everybody was saying was like it's not it's not about shaming other people um or shaming other young people into um living sustainably um, by buying as little as possible or buying from a certain place. Um, can you hear me now still? Okay. Um, or buying from a certain place or buying from certain businesses or not buying this product or that product. Um, I think it's just about like, um, you being responsible for yourself and, um, like leading through example, if anything. Um, I know it's like super dark now, sorry, I should probably move. Um, but like leading through example, I think if anything, um, and then in that way, like if somebody has a question, you can say, well, I've been doing this for so long and um, these are the things that work for me. And if you have any other questions, I can help you in that way. Um, I think that that's probably, what has worked for me in the best way. And I have friends who um, live really sustainable lives and I love asking them all kinds of questions. So, yeah. I think it's important to add also while, like especially talking specifically about feminism and sustainability, although even if you don't pressure other people into like doing stuff, holding veganism on a pedestal is still like as the goal is still problematic um like you know a lot of cultures have meat as like traditions and also they've been doing that sustainably for like since the beginning and not only that but like if you if you hold that on a pedestal it's almost like the people who can't, whether it be, you know, someone is in recovery for an eating disorder, I need that for sustenance. Someone has some sort of, like, just, yeah, they can't eat meat, or no, sorry, other way around, they have to eat meat um, to, like, keep up with iron levels, something like that. Then that's almost like, there's, you have a block to reaching the level that you should be at in a perfect world. And I think that you have to be careful with that because obviously being vegan and like doing all that is a great way to be sustainable, but it's certainly not the only one. And there are ways to 
yeah 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 no I I mean I I think I agree with I definitely agree with you that like being vegan isn't like the goal in life I think that it's just like we I mean I feel like if we're here I think we're all aware of like how um how unhealthy or how I guess I don't know if the word that I'm looking for is unhealthy but like how not great the meat industry is and so it's not really to, in my view it's not necessarily that like we should all aim to be um vegan it's just that like I have a friend who literally her favorite saying is like I love meat um and she'll she'll say she's a meat expletive but um and it's so she it, it, and it's I'm not I never shame her for that but I just I'm bringing it up to say that like in in a conversation with her I have had I've tried to mention to her in conversation that it, the meat industry is not good and that it's unhealthy for the planet and so I totally agree with you that the goal is never veganism but that it should be less meat and I totally hear what you're saying that like there are cultures and there are communities that eat it, that eat meat in great, and like that's part of their community. My, my own uncle, he's, he was a cattle farmer in Venezuela. Um, and so he was like the meat guy who distributed meat in Trujillo. But like, I think that here in the US, it is not necessarily at the same like in the same way and so there are like it's just i i just feel like there's a difference with the way that like we approach me that's all that's the last thing i'll say sorry it's great most of your responses were not at all what i had in mind when i wrote that question so the different perspectives, perfect, because it just brings everything full circle, brings it all together because there's so many different ways to look at it. In my mind, just so you guys know, I wrote this thinking, you know, we think of all of these high end sustainable products or things that are supposed to be eco friendly or green and they typically cost more and somebody who has less of an income especially when they're younger they maybe they don't earn as much or they don't have a job because they're in school how do you afford these things in order to be part of the sustainable group or world you support that so all these other perspectives are amazing thank you so much for that i really appreciate it but then following along that i'm going to go to cars because tucson is this widespread city and to get from one end to another, to try to be able to get yourself from point A to point B or point Z, depending on how much you have to do in a day, it is very difficult to do that without a vehicle. And I spent 10 years living here car free. I've done it, but it means a lot of planning, a lot of management of time, of energy, and how much you can carry any given trip you take. So it's certainly something that can be done here, but I'm curious what your thoughts are about Traversing Tucson, whether you need a vehicle to do that, do we need to change the way that the city is laid out and how accessible everything is? And how do you personally get around as you go about doing what you do? I wish I had more to offer to this um, question because it is just so well structured, but I am not a native Tucsonan. I actually moved here from California and I live on campus. I've been living on campus um, for all three years so far. And so I, I do not have a commute. I, um, you know, live where I study and I just get rides occasionally for my friends to go to the grocery store. So unfortunately, I'm not as familiar um, on this topic as everyone else. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and pass it up along to Sharmia. Hopefully they have some more um, input. Apologies for that. Yeah, um, so I've grown up in Tucson all my life. And this is one thing that I, I think is really interesting because my family for the longest time we only had one car and we all shared it and my parents both work 
I obviously had to go to school, um, but we tried to really limit how many, and our car was like really old, so we like never bought a new car. Um, so we tried to really limit how much we were spending and um, consuming in that way. Um, I think kind of going back to what we were saying earlier about like individual responsibility versus like gen like community responsibility. I think um, again, people should not feel like they have to bike or take public transport, especially in Tucson, because public transport is basically non-existent um, to like be sustainable, especially because a lot of people, um, depending on like where you can live, have to commute really long distances to get to their job. Um, but I think like for what like what every person can do individually is obviously important. I think one of the biggest things that I've seen recently, which is really hopeful to me about Tucson, is um, the the idea to um, do mixed housing within businesses and um, like mixed business residential areas, city areas, so that um, the commutes aren't as far, so that people have resources right by them. Um, it also prevents Tucson from like further expanding into like natural areas. Um, and can keep the city pretty condensed. So I think that that's like a really interesting and good thing that the city is um, working on. And I don't know if anyone else has more information about that, but I'd love to learn more about that as well. Um, to go off of what Shamila was saying, I've also lived in Tucson my entire life, um, born and raised here. Um, and I'm lucky enough that I live very, very close to downtown, which means I'm kind of like central to most places. Um, I'm not in a food desert, unlike a lot of Tucson's population. Um, that being said, you know, a lot of like where I could go when I was littler um, depended on if it was like in walking area or if, you know, there was a bus route um because that's what my family like could afford at the time um so that like definitely needs to change i think one of the biggest things is expanding like the streetcar to be not just like downtown fourth ave and main gate um to have it be like actually like citywide um and i think another big part of public transportation is making sure that it's you know financially accessible to everybody it'd be amazing if it was free um i don't know if that's like technically realistic um but i think that's something that the city should be striving for i know that like i myself i carpool a lot um especially with this one since we're both fully vaccinated now um and then also like i used to ride my bike a lot but then the issue with riding your bike is that there's this like insane heat during the summer and that can be really dangerous um so i think tucson has an issue where everything's super spread out unless you can afford this, you know, really expensive housing in the middle of town, um, which is just getting more and more expensive as time goes on, um, which is, you know, pushing out lower income folks and folks of color. Um, so yeah, <laughs> do you have anything to add? Not really, that was good. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I also don't have a, a ton to say on this one because I am from northern Minnesota and go to college in Tucson. Um, but I would say, again, emphasize I go to college in Tucson. The U of A is the reason that housing is so expensive in the middle of Tucson, and that's frustrating in itself. Um, but in my first two years of college, I was able to ride my bike a lot because that downtown uh, university area does have the resources like that you need um, relatively close by. So it is possible to do that. Um, however, since the pandemic started, a lot of those shops and things that I used to rely on have been closed. Um, so I brought a car for the first time um, this year and have been driving a ton more uh, just to you know stay safer, interact with less people, go to the stores that I know are like enforcing masks and those types of things. Um, so I would say Tucson can definitely benefit from better public transit. I've ridden the bus a few times and gotten horribly lost and took me two hours to get to where I needed to go. You know, it's it's just not a very efficient way um, or a, a way that people feel motivated to use. Um, and I also know as a young woman, like it is a little scary. So I never really wanna go on, on Tucson public transit by myself. 
Um, and I think if it was more universal and there are more people using it and it was better, you know, that would be uh, less of a risk and probably, you know, beneficial. I don't know much about infrastructure though, so I, I can't say how we do that. <laughs> Um, so I, Allegra, you seem to have frozen. I'm not sure if you can hear us, but we cannot hear you. Let's give you a minute here. And if we can get you to come back, that's great. Otherwise, we will move on to the next question and then still let you be able to share on this at some point. Okay, we're going to go ahead and move on to the next question, which in some ways I think is uh, pretty clear because we're all involved in all these different organizations. But here's the question. Do you feel that small groups of educated individuals can truly make a difference in a society and world that seems disconnected from itself? I would say that I do believe this because I've seen it and I'm a part of it, um, especially being a part of this conversation here. I think there's so much power in the people and as long as we find these commonalities and unite and continue these conversations, the people that we elect in office have to listen to us. Otherwise, we're just going to vote them out of office. And the same goes for corporations. If we stop funding their companies, then they're going to have to make a change. So I think there's so much power in the people that we often undermine because we're not um, unified in one dialogue. But we have the potential, and I've seen it, and I know that it can happen. So I remain optimistic on that note. Yeah, I completely agree. And I would even go further to say that we have to believe that it's possible because otherwise, what is the point? Um, I think one of the, like that, that is one hope that just keeps me grounded in this kind of work and um, really uh, encourages me to continue, especially sharing youth voices and um, uplifting youth because I think for the longest time and still today, um, I think youth are, the youth voice has been ignored and undermined for so long because we have very little voting power. Um, we are like financially not independent. There's all these things that make us um, not as, we can't do as much in the traditional ways um, because we don't have as many resources. Um, but I think especially in the last couple of years with huge youth led movements like um, the climate strike, March for our lives, like all of these different things that are completely organized and led by youth. That's been so inspiring to see that um, people who have originally felt very marginalized and disconnected from policy and activism are having this really huge momentum and are able to accomplish so much. So yeah, I, com I completely agree with everything Chelsea said. I just forgot everything. Oh my oh my God. God. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, are you okay? I'm really embarrassed. <laughs> okay. Um, so I would agree with what Chelsea and Tramila said, um, especially with the like, you have to believe, you have to believe that, you know, small groups can do this work and can create this massive change. Um, because like, what is the point if you don't believe that? Um, but also, you do have to be somewhat realistic about it. And I think one small group alone can't accomplish much unless they have like really good connections with people and like they have an in with like their public or their uh, public officials. Um, but small groups working together um, and creating these coalitions of like minded people that are all, um, you know, focusing on different aspects, but all, you know, going towards the same overall goal. That's where change really comes from. Um, you good now? Yeah, I, um, that was my thing too, is like, um, I think expecting small groups to make change all on their own is unrealistic and like damaging to the people doing that work. Um, and it's also unrealistic because then you're like, why isn't, aren't these actions like happening? But when you start getting um, like more smaller groups 
together, that's when change can happen. So yeah, like small scale action work, but in tandem with a lot of other things. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you think about like um, the September 20th climate strike that um, Sunrise Tucson, AZYCC and HS4CJ all worked together um, to, you know, create um, that was a bunch of small groups coming together and then reaching out to even smaller groups and collecting these massive amount of people, um, especially within like high schools. Um, like we reached out to, I don't know, probably like seven different high schools across town um, and tried to make sure that they had a voice in what was happening. Um, and, you know, just getting these like two or three people that went to different schools spreading the word and then creating larger and larger groups until it's just this one big group of you know devoted people um that's where power comes from that's something um that i also think was so amazing to see was like how one person can turn into two can turn into four can turn into like that was crazy to see um and i miss that kind of thing because we're obviously we're not doing like huge in-person actions anymore and that was definitely present at the september 20th strike uh 2019 that was just so amazing like we reached out to just like you know the people we know from different high schools and some of them had like incredible reach um and yeah that was cool just seeing how small things can turn into really big things before i start i will say this call is making me very motivated to try the bus again um but <laughs> i will say i also agree that that small groups can make big change. Um, I also think like when we're talking small, I, I would start at community level. You know, you wanna make sure that in the groups you're representing and in the groups you're a part of, there is pieces of all of your community, a group of only white climate activists that are the same age in college. Like I've been a part of that and we do things. <laughs> do we do everything that needs to get done? Probably not. Um, so I do agree that these coalitions of smaller groups that are working towards similar goals um, is just so, so important. And again, I said this earlier, but like focusing on the community need and addressing what your people need um, should be the priority. And I uh, really like thinking about that. And I would say too, like having a singular voice can also be really damaging. I've seen in a lot of like again collegiate activism like there are people that want to be at the front and center of everything and and their thought on this topic is probably like the best one you know uh and, or in their mind and i think having that like efficiency of of having that one speaker while that is faster if that person is willing to you know if they're if they're doing more work like that's quicker that's getting your message out but like making sure you're considering the other voices and the other seats at the table um, I think is very important and something I've been trying to do a lot this year um, after getting roped into a few different things that felt very one-sided. Um, but yeah, I, I think in Tucson itself, it's, it's a great example to see so many groups coming together all the time. Uh, we just got, you know, a climate emergency declared uh, by the mayor of Tucson and you don't see that in a lot of places. So like huge props um, to the people here. And I think there's a lot more things coming, but it's it's coming from different groups, even outside of the climate space, you know, teaming up and making sure we understand each other's needs. Um, Sharia, can you rephrase the questions for me real quick, just so that I, I know, because I think I have an idea yes. of what they are. But I just right, so the first one was about transportation and cars and usage. And the second one was do you feel that small groups of educated people can make a difference in a world that seems so disconnected from itself? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so the first one, um, what uh, about transportation? Um, so I live in Marana, um, and that's really far away from a lot of things, is what I was going to say. Um, so I, I currently drive to a lot of places. Um, my work um mostly and then downtown um to volunteering opportunities um and then if i'm downtown i usually will walk um but uh, as far as using public transportation um 
I don't commonly use public transportation very often, um, but I think that, um, I mean, I ha I've used the, what is it, the SunTran a little bit, um, and then the trolley um, to do, um, I think it was, it was like a, an, I was volunteering with um, a nonprofit and going to like a bridge event. Um, and then that was really, really cool. I think that was probably like my first time using the trolley. Um, and that was, it's, it's actually a really cool system, but it like, like uh, Ruby said, it doesn't go very far. Um, and um, I think, I think a lot of people would really benefit if that went um, a lot farther and if it was more accessible. Um, Cause I didn't realize that it cost, uh, I think it, I don't actually know how much it costs, but it, it, I didn't realize that we had to like pay um, a lot of like that there was like a ticket that cost like, I don't remember how much it costs right now off the top of my head. Um, but it like costs something. And then um, because I was with a group, um, the they had like prepaid for the tickets. Um, and, um, and so then I'm really grateful, but it's not always going to be the case and people have to like pay for that themselves. Um, but I, I think that our, um, I think I was talking to my friend the other day, um, my other Sunriser co-lead and they had mentioned that because of like construction, there are like bus stops in like the road and I couldn't even like believe that. And so I'm really hoping that our public transportation can really improve. Um, and I think Franny also brought up a really important uh, topic, which was the safety, feeling safe on in public transportation. Um, yeah, um, and then um, as far as like, can small hubs, um, small groups of people be connected in this time that is so disconnected, is that right? Yeah. Well, can we make a difference in a world that oh, seems so difference? disconnected from everything that's happening around us? Um, I think that we, I think that we can make a difference. Um, I, I agree with what um, most people were saying about it being a real collaborative effort with other um, groups. Um, uh, I think it's really about like, being able to like um it's like putting yourself out there making the connection i know uh we're talking about like being disconnected but i think that um something that i have really uh really realized and recognized um about um this time of covid is that we're all really connected um virtually and so if we make that, at least that first contact, that second contact, um, whether it's through Instagram, via email, um, that is one way of connecting. Um, and then there are a lot of organizations that are still doing like in-person actions um, and that are COVID safe. Um, and so there are a lot of, things that we can still do in person. And now that um, I know that it's not, uh, not everybody is vaccinated, but there are still um, ways to participate in uh, like a COVID safe action, um, socially distance and still do things that are in our community and make a difference. Um, whether that's like fruit harvesting with like a group like um, Ishkashita, um, Ishkashita Refugee Network, um, if you, uh, one of the things that I have recently done is there's a reconciliation program um, at the Santa Cruz that's happening on Sunday um, from eight to 11. Um, it's a really great program. Um, and we just pull buffalo grass and clean up the Santa Cruz. Um, and that is open to the public and you are, we are socially distanced wearing masks 
and the tools are provided. Um, there are like different like actions that are planting trees like um, Sharia was talking about that are being talked about. Um, and like, even if you're just like meeting at a park, which I have seen um, groups like Mass Lib and um, oh, I'm blanking. Um, I think it's like community, community for the people, um, distributing food, um, things like that. Like you can still participate and be a part of those things. Um, and, you know, make a difference. I think every day or every time you show up. Um, and I think that there's a lot still going on and, and when I talk about like reaching out virtually, I think it's just about, you know, asking where, where, where's it happening? What do I have to do? Um, and a lot of these groups are just like, here's what you do. And um, I think the great thing about, um, about um, mutual aid groups, about nonprofits, about um, like, people who are involved in this, in this sustainable regenerative movement is that we're all really um, like moved to like get going and like to include people. It is, um, I think Adrian Marie Brown is like, it's a low bar um, for, <laughs> for in inclusivity. And it's just like a high bar to keep you in, you know, like just keep coming at, keep coming and keep showing up. Um, so that's it. I think that's, that's my thing. Thank you. So technically there's two more questions left, but I'm going to cut it down to one because I think that they lead into each other. The first question was supposed to be, is there anything that gives you hope for the future? And the next one was, what can we do to help? So let's go there. What can we do to help so that you have hope for the future? Let's put it that way because I know that we have about 20 minutes left or so, so I wanna be sure that everybody gets a chance to uh, be heard, but also that we can get a few other questions in. And Dante has a question that I don't want people to miss in case they didn't see it in the chat. Great question. First, I'll answer um, Sharia's question, and then I'll get to Dante's in the chat. Um, so I think one of the things that gives me hope is noticing how many people are acknowledging the interconnections between environmental issues and other issues such as environmental ju um, environmental justice because that is health justice that is cultural and restorative justice that is um, social justice so i think once we all realize this and i've seen it um, occurring more and more especially on campus creating coalitions with other groups is that by acknowledging that we're all essentially fighting for the same thing we build so much more strength um, and that is very empowering to me. And I think one of the ways that we can use that um, empowering message is to join these groups that are based on inter interconnections and intersectionality. I think by also inviting um, groups to, to the discussion that are based on diversity and including diverse perspectives, we can do so much more because um, as we've just seen in this conversation, you take one question and there's just so many perspectives that answer the, th the same thing. So I think those different ideas and new ideas are just one way that's really going to propel us to meet all the go goals that we would want to meet. Um, and I'm trying to see the question that was mentioned in the chat. Is it, um, are any of you available to have a Zoom conversation? Is it that one? Okay. Yes, I just I was just finishing up reading that question. I would say yes, and I can um, include the email to students for sustainability in the chat right now. And feel free to reach out. We're always welcome to continuing the conversation. And thank you for having us here. Uh, yeah, I would um, second everything Chelsea said. I um, I think one of the biggest things is recognizing the need for community members of all. Uh, creeds to come together and um, to recognize that there's a place for everybody in the environmental justice movement, no matter like who you are, or what you can give. Um, and um, specifically, like my organization, we mostly work with youth. 
Um, so a lot of our, our outreach efforts are towards them. Um, but we really appreciate people sharing information about um, our, our group and what and um, helping it spread to all of the youth in Tucson. So I will be putting links to our organization's contact information in the chat. Um, but yeah, I think overall, just thinking about um, what we can do uh, ourselves in our community and not trying to rely too much on other bigger structures to make changes for us that um, they have never made before. Um, and also going back to the previous question about like, should we be putting our money where our mouths are? If we're talking about how time is money, I think also agreeing with um, what Allegria and Chelsea were saying about uh, just finding time to volunteer and really um, giving back to your community and just giving time, I think is really important. Um, so definitely agree with Sharmila and Chelsea um, about just like getting more people involved. Um, one of the things I said earlier is that our group, HS4CJ, um, relies entirely on donations for everything we do. Um, we go through Venmo. Um, we used to take cash donations, but not so much anymore. Um, Venmo less. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but don't want to sound like greedy, but yeah, we could really use donations. Our Venmo is at hs4cj um and we can also put our venmo our instagram and our email in the chat um definitely if you know any high schoolers or middle schoolers interested in working with us um send them our way um and yeah we're always happy to do events like these um with outreach and that kind of thing um but definitely donations um all of our donations go back into the movement most of it is used or uh, protest safety supplies. Um, yeah, we've also, um, we did like a fundraiser um, for the Paskayaki tribe a while ago and we're going to do one soon. We're still finalizing details, but um, if you see those, that's also a really great way to help because yeah, that's great. Um, definitely sending people our way. A lot of our members are graduating this year. Yeah. So like, <laughs> um, but then, Oh God, I'm forgetting again. I'm such a mess. Um, okay, that, but yeah, then. yeah, we'll put all of our information in the chat. All right, I'll hop in. Um, I'll also preface I'm in involved in like a few multi, a few climate organizations. Uh, Green Guides is my job, and then in my spare time, I try to fight the systems but it doesn't always work out. Um, anyways, so I would say I really, really agree with Chelsea in that I've gotten a lot of hope this year in realizing like the intersectionality of climate change. Um, I think in the past, I've definitely been thinking of it as, you know, I, this I need to pick one issue and then like dedicate my life to that. But the idea is actually that all of the issues are sort of stemming from the same thing and um, by working with one or, or working with one and expanding that out to other issues you you can do a lot more and I think that feels um, very good and I would say something that I've gotten a lot of like benefit from um, is just like doing my job and realizing that there's so many opportunities to make a career in sustainability or get out and do something on the weekend like there are just so many like little places you can dip your toes into um, which I think is really awesome. So I would say um, for what you can do to help, uh, it appears that this this Zoom call is full of a plethora of Tucson knowledge. So I would say uh, as a guide for University of Arizona students, uh, definitely need help figuring out, you know, like the best tips to give to give students. So any email that you have, like, oh, I'm doing a volunteer this week, uh, volunteering opportunity this weekend, or you know, here's a guide to how to use Tucson buses or any of those things. Um, I'm the only person that runs like the Instagram account and this outreach. So uh, any help is is useful because it is hard to find everything yourself. Um, and then I'll plug one more organization I'm involved in. I'm currently part of uh, U Arizona Divest. We're a new organization at the U of A um, that's trying to work with the University of Arizona Foundation or against them, um, up to them how that goes, but um, to try and get the U of A to take money out of fossil fuels. They currently have um, upwards of $60 million invested um, in that. So we're working on that and 
very early on in the process. So, so trying to just get outreach and let people know about our organization um, and get petition signatures to push the U of A to divest from Tucsonians or students. Um, it's all really beneficial. So I will drop my email in the chat as well as the link to the Green Guides um, monthly newsletter where we include opportunities. If you guys want to subscribe to that and look at them or also subscribe and send me um, information about opportunities that you guys have or know about, um, that's super helpful. So thank you. Um, wow, I am so amazed by everybody and all of their work and like you guys are all incredible. Um, so I totally am 100% agree with um, what uh, Chelsea, Shamilia, and Franny, I don't think I said Shamat, Shamilia? No, I'm not saying your name right at all. Shamilla, it's okay. <laughs> Shamilla. Sorry, um, from one person who has a difficult name to another, here, Sharmila. Sharmila. Okay, um, I'm sorry. I will say your name correctly. Sharmila and Franny. Um, uh, I agree with what they what what you all were talking about. Um, as as far as like intersections go, um, and how like that is, um how I have like been seeing um, my activism um, and how I got involved with like Sunrise especially. Um, I think that like it started with um, climate change and then um, I really got like in involved and invested with like, um, I, got, I got it into my head that I really needed to focus only on border issues because of what was happening with my family um, in Venezuela. And I wanted to help better um, what was happening at the border. And then um, I realized that a lot of the people who were at the border were there because they had fled because of climate change. And I was like, this is all related. Like my activism is related and um, I, I've noticed that like as like a reoccurring pattern. And so I totally, um, I feel what you guys are saying. Um, um, as far as like how to, how like the, how, like how to help or how to continue to like reach out to Sunrise, um, Sunrise Tucson, um, we are going to be hosting like events in the park um, pretty soon and we're going to have flyers up, um, on our Instagram. So I can put our sunrise Tucson, um, Instagram, um, in the chat. Um, and, um, we have a newsletter that also goes out. Um, so if you would like to receive that, you can, um, message me. I can also put my contact information in the chat. Um, we, put usually like different actions that are happening in the community. So if you would like to be included in the newsletter, um, we have like a growing hub right now. So um, that is something that we can distribute to a growing number of people. Um, we are doing listening sessions right now with uh, the city with the city um, and the mayor of Tucson. Um, and so we are currently looking for groups um, to, if you would like to host a listening session, um, if you think that like your, um, your, your club or your community would like to host a listening session um, to talk about how climate change has impacted you and what are some solutions that you think um, would be like helpful for your community um please contact um i think amelia is in this group here as well um amelia marsh um you can just you can either message us on on instagram as well um that's one of the actions that's really coming up and so if you would like to be if you're interested in that um yeah there she is 
Um, so she'll put her email in the chat. Um, and I think that that's like we right now, I think that the biggest thing for like community actions um, for us is just like to if you if you're interested and, and I think like in anything, it's just like keep showing up. Um, I, I just think like the I think that it's incredibly important, like you all were saying, like donations are incredibly important. Um, but more than more than somebody said, like your time is money. I think that was they were mentioning it at the end of like the last question, but like um I think it's incredibly valuable when people show up and just spend even like 30 minutes at an action. Um and are just like they're listening to what somebody has to say, participating in a tree planting um, or doing something for their community. So just keep showing up is my, how you can help. <laughs> Thank you all so very much for your time, for everything that you've shared um, and for just showing up because as we all know, that is the first step. So I really, really appreciate that. The one thing that I can offer you from Sustainable Tucson is, and I'm gonna put a link to it in the, the chat, is that we just completed our very first session of an ambassadors and sustainability uh, program for Sustainable Tucson. It was a 12 week program. We've already decided to bump it to 14 weeks because we knew there were a couple things that needed to be added. It's only two to three hours for a week. It's usually on a Saturday morning from 10 until 12. And then there's links that we send out with uh, other information based on that week's topic. Um, but the cost is only $50. There is a possibility of paying $25 and there's possibility of full scholarship. And so it's just committing to the full program. It's all about sustainability as it impacts Tucson and Southern Arizona. And each week is a different subject, a different topic, and a way of looking at sustainability here for where you're currently living. If you're at all interested, please check out the link or please email me. We'll be starting back again in August for the second series. Um, and they will have so much information that is not necessarily covered um, in your day-to-day -day research or impact or lessons that you might find elsewhere. So if you're interested, I really would like to encourage you to even share the information. If you if you yourself don't feel like you have the time to commit or you have other things going on, go ahead and share it with those in your organization because I think that um, it's really good information. And Dan says, what about making these ambassadors from? That's actually been my goal since I started with Sustainable Tucson three years ago, as uh, Trace and Paula will tell you, my very first meeting with them, that was exactly what I wanted to do was create a youth program. But there are so many youth organizations here now that I don't want to take away from that. I really want to encourage you to be supported in what you do, but also any ways that we can work together and create more of that camaraderie, more of that community, I think is really important. So thank you for being here. Um, I do want to give an opportunity for people to ask a couple questions. Obviously, we're running short on time. If you want to raise your hand, that would be the easiest way to do it. I see Trace is waving a hand at me. Go ahead, Trace. Well, I just wanted to, to say that we really want to keep in touch with your groups. So there's two kinds of ways to do it. One is to uh, put you on our newsletter list so that you know about monthly meetings and ambassador programs and the like. And the other is if we can get information from you about possible activities we can promote. Uh, so does every one of our panelists, are you interested in getting the monthly news? newsletter okay. yes i'm interested well i am great well we'd love to send it to you so if everybody put your email 
in the chat and we'll connect that and okay. so i think they already have done that part and i just put paula's email in there um so uh that way she's the person who puts our newsletter together so if you're interested and you did not get it we usually send out two notices a month one is uh first of the month and then the other is a reminder a couple of days before our general meeting which is tonight so it's that second tuesday so um, it's an easy way to do it and we'd be really glad to be able to promote events and activities that all of these groups are doing so that more people in town for instance high schoolers can connect in the appropriate ways so we can try to get the word out for you as well okay does anybody else have a question that hasn't been answered or directed yet i don't know if this is too big of a question but i was wondering like what what i i've worked with some other youth and there's a lot of youth that aren't really like even aware or you don't care about this issue i was wondering what inspired you guys to to do this work? You know, when did you when did you wake up to an issue that so much that you decided to be activists on it? I could go ahead and answer that one first. Um, so I was actually in high school when I took my first environmental science course, and I learned about the injustice with Monsanto, so the company that would produce um, the pesticide Roundup and how they lied about um, the safety of their products and the pesticides. And they intentionally spread propaganda to convince people that it was safe to use. And we're still stuck in that cycle of using pesticides and being reliant on th that usage. Um, and I think that blindsiding an entire population of people in order to make profits was really struck home to me especially with um, their involvement with DDT, one of the types of pesticides that they use. I recently learned that my own grandfather, um, he was a migrant farm worker here and they sprayed him down head to toe with nothing protecting him with DDT. And this is known to cause cancer and known um, to just be devastating for your health. And so I think that like that mistrust with that corporation really just struck a chord with me and brought me to the movement and I'm glad it did. Um, I was also in high school. Um, I was working on like a senior capstone project and um, I decided to work on a um, project uh, for um, refugees um, with like the global citizens. Um, I was thinking about my I was thinking about my I was thinking about my family that lives in another country and how I hadn't seen them in a really long time and how it would be nice to share a meal with them. Um, and my aunt, my aunt runs um, she she's part of Ishka, she's the director of Ishkashita and um, I wanted to help her bring together refugees um, and our community. And so I helped put together like a meal, um, a sit down meal. And we all like sat down together and we like had like a really nice, like very um, like family like discussion and just talk to one another. Um, and um, people like bought plates. And then at the end of that, I like donated that money back to like her organization. Um, and I, it wasn't climate related, but it was my first, um, real like step towards activism and like making like a global and like a global way. And I was like, this is what I kind of really want to be moving towards, um, kind of for the rest of my life. And what, what motivated me was, um, considering and thinking about my family. I can just jump in really fast. I would say um, 
my motivation was very simple. Like growing up in Northern Minnesota, I had forests on forests in my backyard and I was very privileged to have that opportunity. Um, but when I was in high school, they, I guess I started hearing about proposals to start mining in the Boundary Waters canoe area. If anyone's heard of that, it's like super heavily protected. I literally didn't think you could touch it because you can't even bring a motorboat in there. So why should you be able to mine or put a pipeline there? Um, so I think as soon as I started hearing about that, it was like a snowball effect of learning more and more things. Um, and then since being in college, like I have been motivated to kind of share that outdoor space with my best friends, because I think that's where my main passion comes from, is like preserving all the beauty that we have um, and sharing it with people as much as we can. Um, and I think after people found out that I liked that, um, I just kept getting approached to like do things on campus associated with sustainability. So I kind of would label it as like an accidental activism thing because it was like one small event led to, you know, like going to a meeting, it led to, you know, working with a group or starting a group. Um, and I think, yeah, that's, that's how it worked. It was kind of fun. I know we're running over on time, but I'll also jump in really quickly. Um, my, when I was growing up, I watched like a ton of nature documentaries. And so for a while, I just like really wanted to work with endangered species. Um, my first like real dive into activism was um, with March for Our Lives. I was um, one of the local organizers for it in Tucson. And that was the first time that I like dedicated that much time to doing something for my community outside of um, like a, a really planned organization. Like it was really cool being part of a, a youth led youth organized thing that um, hadn't really been set up yet. And that was um, very much up to like young people to figure out. Um, and then from there, I was able to be connected with so many amazing people and then found other opportunities um, through that. But yeah, that's where I got started. Ursula and Ruby, did you have a story, have stories? Um, mine isn't so much of a story as it is just kind of like a weird, like, progression of events. Um, basically, in seventh grade, um, which is when, like, the first time that I got, like, an actual, like, climate education, um, we were learning about the Koch brothers and just how they've kind of, um, created this huge monopoly on fossil fuels and how, you know, they've like creeped their way into education. Um, and then my science teacher, Ariana Morfelson, some of you might know her, um, she started working with Sunrise Tucson. And then like, I don't know, two years later, when I was in ninth grade when I was a freshman, um, she reached out and was like, we're doing this town hall. Do you want to come speak at it? Um, you can just talk about like, your interest in this stuff um and so that's kind of how i got started i spoke at that town hall um and then got more involved with sunrise tucson um and then got involved with arizona youth climate coalition and then i started hs4cj um but i guess like kind of before that part of me was always just like you know really concerned with like preserving the monsoons here because that was like a big part of my childhood. Um, Cause at like the bottom of my street floods every year when there's a monsoon. So when I was like a kid, I would like play in that with my sisters. And that was like a big part of my childhood. Um, and now you see that like the monsoons here are very rapidly like just leaving and like not, you know, happening anymore. Um, so like preserving that has been like a big factor in my activism. I mean, my story is for the beginning of what you said, it's like the exact same thing. We went to middle school together. So I was in that class. Ariana approached me about that same town hall, like the same story um, for like the, I guess, like the technical practical side of that. Um, I think my journey into activism, it definitely didn't start with climate justice. It more started with um, like identity stuff. So um, like I got involved 
with like different feminist organizations and going to protests as well as like discovering my queer identity. I like took that road. Um, and then as like me, hmm, me figuring out my identity and then going like to activism stuff, that kind of, that activism, God, it progressed into climate stuff. <laughs> Those were all great stories. We were just, I think we all enjoy just hearing what inspired you to work on that. You know, it, uh, we're so thankful for your work. We really are. It, um, for us, for those of us at Sustainable Tucson who have been like doing the good fight for a while, it sometimes kind of feels hopeless. And uh, maybe that's why Sharia had the, you know, questions about being sad or <laughs> being angry because it's frustrating when more of, you know, more people aren't getting on board, but it, it, it really, it's been really uplifting to hear you guys' stories, why you did it, and what you're doing. I really am really thankful of that. And thankful to Sharia for organizing it. More power to us all as we fight together. Well, thank you. Lisa raising her hand or clapping. <laughs> Clapping, wonderful job. I enjoyed listening to everybody. Well, I want to say thank you to our panelists, to Ursula and Ruby, to Kelsey and Franny and Jamila. And I'm going to say it wrong because I keep wanting to say Alegria and I know it's wrong. <laughs> I don't know how to say it. Alegria, is that it? Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'm working on it. But thank you so much again for showing up, for participating, for being amazing human beings, for doing the work, for holding the space, for being part of organizations that allow people to find their footing and figure out how they want to participate as we all move forward in this. Um, as Ursula and Ruby were saying, people move on we get to a different level to a different stage to a different age and we all have to find our place so each of these organizations has something to offer a place for people to find themselves and to do the work and i really appreciate you participating holding those spaces keeping them open making them available to people and continuing the conversation which is really what we all have to do the job is going to be a lot of things that we still have to work on we will still have to come up with more solutions we will still have to find more ways of working together. And I really thank you for being part of that and allowing us to be part of the conversation with you because it may sound like a long ways away, but the 20 and 30 years that those of us have been working in this, have been working in this and how long you've been alive, it goes really fast. And we really are hopeful that when you get to be where we are in life, that we have made much more progress because we are working together. So thank you for joining us tonight.